500 units, sold out pretty quickly. That's kind of where the journey began. Hey Bud is a natural skincare alternative. We combine the best of the clinical best ingredients that are on market and then combining the best of what nature has to offer as well. We looked at hemp and it had all these hydrating properties. So why not combine the hydrating properties of hemp and the clay mask together? So we came out with the hydrating hemp clay mask. Definitely a lot of pressure on our shoulders. We're the ones that I guess every Monday morning bring the energy. People are everything business. They are 100% the reason why we're growing as fast as we are. If you had to name one trait or characteristic that a founder and entrepreneur needed to be successful, what do you think that one trait be? Probably grit. It's tough. It's really tough. You have to really feel it internally. Um, I know that for myself. I couldn't not do it. The best outcome was still not what I wanted. You know, if I became partner, if I did all these things, when I really looked at it, it's not what I wanted. And for us, it was probably a fairly easy decision. And is it true that you got carpal tunnel packing orders? <laughs> the days I heard a little whisper. I'm not sure who told you that. One, but, um, <laughs> I had to do it to save money. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just quickly before we get started, guys, if you've been enjoying the podcast, can I please ask that you consider leaving a five-star review and subscribing on whatever platform you've been listening. It really helps the podcast grow. All right, we're on, boys. We're here we're starting off the Melbourne trip with the bang. Five podcasts in two days. We've got the Hey Bud Skincare Boys. have absolutely killed it over the last four years. Uh, we caught up a couple of years ago and you've come so fucking far since then. So we've got Alex Roslaniak, Fidel D'Amico and Ollie Watts, the three killers, have done amazing things with Ecom. Want to chat to you about everything you've built, the journey over the last four years. Um, on top of Ecom, you've also, you're in Priceline stores across the country now. So expanding into retail and talk about all of that because channel diversification for Ecom brands, if you can get into retail. I remember when we started, I don't know about you guys. I was like, oh, I don't really know if I want to get into to, to retail. Kind of like having the control, but fuck pulling the trigger on retail was an amazing decision for, for Happy Skin. And I imagine it was the same for you guys. So thanks boys. It's going to be fun. We've got three guests at a, at a time. So Super we'll figure out man. how to- yeah. Put, pass around the mics and stuff, but welcome to Melbourne. Thanks, Thanks man. Coming. Thanks Very for having excited. us, buddy. Um, look, boys, let's start with at the beginning. Now, we're going to get through the journey and everything, but for anyone who doesn't know Hey Bud Skincare, they obviously haven't spent much time on Instagram over the last few years, but tell everyone that's listening kind of what you guys are, what you guys do now, where the business is at today, and then we'll kind of rewind, talk about the journey, the ups and downs, all that sort of fun stuff. Yeah, absolutely. I can start off so Hey Bud is a natural skincare alternative. Um, so we started off with problem skin. Um, we added on oily and dry. Um, now we target um, about seven different categories. So we combine the best of uh, uh, the, the clinical best ingredients that are on market and then combining the best of what nature has to offer as well. Hemp is kind of our main superpower ingredient. So it's got a lot of different benefits and super versatile. Uh, so we try and make uh, skincare, which is something really complex, as simple as possible, um, and then help people with different target skincare needs. And what do you think, we're obviously going to get into all the nitty gritty of it, but what do you think is like one of the core things that you guys did so well that, that, you know, made your success come to fruition? You had to put it down to one core thing. I would say having an, an open slate to, to general business. So I think like early days, you're actually quite naive and delusional, <laughs> uh, but I actually think that that plays to your strength where you try anything and everything and yeah. uh, you don't have a roadblock of like what's possible. I find that the the further you get along business, the more scars you get, the more you realize, ah, oh, shit, this is actually harder than I thought. I know. And you think that you think about things a lot more, which is great because once you've built a bit of a business, like you obviously have something for tech. So I feel like you become more risk adverse. Like the yeah. longer you get yeah, into yeah, it, the yeah, more yeah, experience yeah. you get at the start, you're like, fuck yeah, pull totally. the trigger on this. We'll move into that market. We'll launch this product. But yeah. it is a journey uh, for sure. Now, three of you guys, three founders, I, I, I love that. How do you guys kind of break up the roles? I know it's a question you've been asked before, but how does that work? How do you guys work together in a way like that? Because I know in business, sometimes with two founders can be very difficult communicating through issues and breaking up roles and stuff. How have you guys been able to navigate that? Yeah, absolutely. I think one of the one of the benefits we have, we're actually very different people. Um, and that actually came by fluke. Um, <laughs> we definitely didn't plan it, but it's definitely helped us and been super advantageous. You know, we've got Ollie, super detailed. Uh, he looks after our ops, our finance. Um, I head up our marketing and Alex heads up our sales. So um, we've kind of just naturally fallen into those roles. Um, and it's definitely helped us that it's, it's actually just our natural skill set. Alex is a great public speaker, but great um, face of the brand. Um, I'm more on the ma uh, marketing side of things. Um, I love, you know, obviously paid, paid is where, where we kind of came from. I love all that stuff and, and all as well um, comes supernatural. So it's been super easy to, to split the Were roles. Were you guys and responsibilities. mates before you launched this or how'd you guys meet? Like where did the idea come to start? Hey bud. Yeah, we um we actually I think you two played tennis. 
together? Me and Ola played tennis for three years together. Yeah. Um, me and Fedor went to school together, so we've known each other since we were 12 years old. Um, and then we all did the same uni course at Monash University together. How was uni? Did you just finish? <laughs> course <laughs> <laughs> me just <laughs> man i lasted like three months in uni and i was out it was too much for me yeah, 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 yeah. um but yeah no we met some great people at uni and so yeah definitely worthwhile but um just to touch on how we've sort of stayed together one really good thing alex set up was just sort of we we have feedback sessions every week every two weeks and um so if there's any ever any issues, we sort of address it right then and there rather than letting things build up, which is really helpful. At the start, was that something um, for you guys that was a little bit more uncomfortable to, to do? And then obviously we're doing it for so long, it opens up, obviously sounds great, but was that a little bit of a challenge at the start to have to Absolutely, deliver feedback? Man. Absolutely. I think like you kind of get used to it in a relationship and when you do it with your mates, <laughs> it's a bit weird. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I still remember when we had our first ever like meeting um, at Fidel's mum's house and it was so weird. It was like, so what's the agenda? Yeah. <laughs> you know? um, but yeah, over time, I think we realized there was something super powerful and the way I kind of look at it is like, it's like a bit of an emotional bank account. It's like you might build up, you know, whether it be a little bit frustration towards something and unless you kind of speak about it, um, you, you might build up a bit of frustration or resentment and so every two, because we have these opportunity to like um, let that emotional bank account empty. And then I always feel that all of us are actually much closer afterwards as well. Same thing. Yeah. Like with relationships, like sometimes like the more open the communication is, the better it is. Yeah, and like, yeah, yeah. even if it's like a five minute, you have to have like a uncomfortable conversation for five minutes. It benefits the rest of the day, week, year. You know what I mean? Definitely. Also, how funny is this? I don't know if anyone can tell from the cameras, but I nod my head a lot. And these two are <laughs> just bouncing. <laughs> um, so, yeah, where did the idea come from for, for Hey Bud itself? Now, you guys came together, you're like, let's start a business. And then where did the idea, like, did you know beauty? Did you know skincare? How, talk about the ideation yeah. process. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So, um, so Fidel and I struggled with acne throughout our teens and our 20s. Um, tried everything on the market from benzoyl peroxide to proactive. Nothing really worked for us. I ended up going on prescription medicine. Fast forward a couple of years later, Fidel's mom, who's a beauty therapist and has been for over 20 years. So she's in the latest um, know of all the skincare trends and she was experiencing redness on her face at the time. Um, and she had heard about hemp seed oil, which back in 2017 was mainly available in the US. No one in Australia was using it at all. Um, and then the TJ only um, allowed it towards the end of the 2017 uh. as well. So she had ordered it down within a couple of weeks of using it, her skin redness went down, hydration went up. Um, then Fidel kind of brought us the idea. Uh, we started looking into hemp and there were some studies suggesting the reduction of acne and hemp. So then we went um, kind of looking into the market and we saw that clay masks were really quite popular for problem skin. But the biggest problem with them was that um, when they draw out the impurities from the face and draw out all the oils, they actually cause a lot of dryness and irritation. So we thought we looked at hemp and it had all these hydrating properties. So why not combine the hydrating properties of hemp and the clay mask together. So we came out with a hydrating hemp clay mask, 500 units, sold out pretty quickly. Um, and then, yeah, that's kind of where the journey began. That's sick. So it's all comes down to Fidel's mom. Shout yeah. out to Fidel's mom. <laughs> Thanks for everything. <laughs> <laughs> got to give, give us Flicker some dividends, you know what for I mean? For sure. <laughs> um, uh, I love that. And talk to me about the, uh, the, the process because this is with anyone that wants to start an econ business. I know you guys are pretty big in the space now. I'm sure loads of people come to you guys for advice and questions. And something I see a lot, I'm sure you guys do too, is like this, everyone has an idea for a business and they want to do it. It's like 90% of people don't get past the stage of it's just an idea or a dream. Or they might even order samples from, from somewhere like Alibaba or they find a manufacturer, but then it gets a little bit hard. They don't really know the next answer. So they stop. How did you guys then take it from the idea to, to an actual brand? Obviously with your sort of products, imagine there was a product research and, and some sampling processes to get that right. Yeah. I think um, it all starts with a lot, a lot of research. I think, um, you know, where we do come from a, a fairly entrepreneurial background, we, we, we have that personality type. Um, but I think it, it really, uh, for us, it was try as many things as possible. We had, you know, a couple of failed companies before Hey Bud. Um, so it wasn't our first go at it. And I think throughout each of those failed attempts, we, we learned so much and it was, okay, you know, the first business, we get to stage one. The second business, we get to stage two. But from there, it was, it's, it's really just trying to absorb as much information as you can, talk to many as many people as you can to get to that next step. Um, for us, uh, you know, I, we always went by saying it was 
There's no course in the world um, that we could have paid for um, that would give us as much experience than starting a business. And so for us, it was it was a no brainer. It was go you know as deep as possible into it, um, and and it was just one step after the other. Watching you know the people who were successful before us, what did they do? Who did they talk to? Um, how were they finding their products? You know, there's there's a lot of websites out there can, that can help you. Obviously, um, Trend Hundo is I think a you know a globally recognized um, website that helps you um, keep track of all different types of trends and stuff like that. Um, so you know, pulling on all those resources as much as you can is going to definitely benefit you. Um, and then from there, it's you know thinking about um, what who do you need on your team. Obviously, good founders is is the first is the first place. From there, you know, for us, it was about um, the manufacturing of the product. That was probably the most important part. So how do we find the best um, chemists and, and manufacturers in Australia to, to help us along the journey? Um, but from there, honestly, it's, it's such a big journey. It's kind of hard to, to really uh, put where, where to start, but it's one foot in front of the other. It's fail as many times as you can and just keep going. I, I feel like what would have helped, because looking back with, with me and George in the, in the early days of Abyskin, like, Sometimes you'd get stuck at a problem and then like, you'd feel like, fuck, like, and then the other person would pull the other person up. And then sometimes the other person's down or not feeling it. And, the, and cause you don't want to let the team down. So having three of you there, I feel like could have helped, but you said something, I think it's always interesting to know what was one of the other failed businesses that, that didn't work and why do you think it wasn't <laughs> successful? Uh, yeah. yeah. So we, um, funny enough. So, uh, I thought it'd be a funny story to mention. So early days. So we always had that kind of like entrepreneurial bug. Um, we actually like rented an office just so that we could have like the motivation or inspiration to go in there and start working on ideas. That. I yeah. Love that. So we're spending um, 250 a week for this really like little shitty office. Um, Environment, man. It's a massive factor. Yeah. State change, everything. We'd mm-hmm. go there on the weekends or after hours, after our um, day jobs. Um, and we'd just be like playing around all these different ideas. So the first one that we actually started off with was, was a weight loss coffee. Mm-hmm. Um, so, uh, yeah, we just, we got all these like different natural additives in then combined it with like an instant coffee powder. Um, it was a decent product, but it, it tasted like shit. So, <laughs> <laughs> so oh, that never took off. man, I've, I, uh, yeah, I've tasted a lot of those. Yeah. <laughs> they're never good, man. Oh yeah. yeah. I don't know. Some, yeah. they're, they're not the best. We looked at like skinny me tea and we're like, well, there's no coffee version of it. So I hey, tried right, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And what were you doing before? Ollie, you were in like finance or you're pr- like in, in corporate. What uh, were you doing? Yeah, I was in insurance. And what, what did you, did you take anything? Was there any learnings that you took from working in such a big business and then coming in to like such a small business that you're able to add to the team because of that experience? Um, well, yes, sort of what Fidel touched on. I'm quite good with detail, looking at the day-to-day operations of the business and managing finances. I think um, just my obsession with money really helped there with the finance <laughs> aspect. And then, um, but yeah, other than that, um, it was, the insurance job just really helped with like the time management of um, and working on something else outside of that. I know that Fidel and Alex both came from big four accounting firms and so they didn't have much time um, with that, whereas I was able to, you know, maybe start on the business a bit more um, and work on that full time from the beginning. One thing about Ollie as well is that he is the best person to save money within the business. Yeah, I mean, like if I spend three dollars on a pen, Ollie will like <laughs> message me at nine pm, being like, "Do you have a receipt for that?" <laughs> <laughs> what's What's one of your biggest uh, money, like money saving areas in ecom that you could share with someone? Um. One thing that's really helped us was just um, like some some of the operational sides of it. Um, we've had had to outsource, um, which which has helped massively. So um, just sort of like the day to day running of the business, um, whether it's sort of um, responding or it's, it's standard templates to people um, with shipping updates, where there's actually not much um, customer service required. A lot of that's outsourced. Yeah. Which, um, which has helped massively for us. And is it true that you got carpal tunnel packing orders back <laughs> in the early days? I heard a little whisper. Not sure who told you that. One, but, um, <laughs> I, I had to do it to save money. Yeah. <laughs> what, well, on that, the, the, obviously with you guys, it's different to product like ours. Ours is like 250 to $300 AAV. Obviously they hit big revenue. It's way less packing. It's much more simple. It's one thing. But we've done the exercise so many times. Obviously in the, in the US, we have a 3PL as of like a year and a half ago. But- up until then, like still in Australia, we, we, we ship our own orders. 
for you guys, when did the point come that it was better for you guys to go to a 3PL rather than sacrificing your own limbs? Probably when I got carpal tunnel. <laughs> <laughs> we had no other option. <laughs> um, we, I think when we started, obviously, um, it was – it was sort of a bit of a more slower burn. So like we were doing like 10, 20, 30 orders. Once we were hitting a hundred orders a day, like we, we couldn't keep up. Yeah. So we, we had to outsource it. Um, yeah. Well, he was a weapon. I don't know how he did it. Cause um, so obviously he was doing it for, for a long time, just kind of him. Uh, and then over time, so we get to like Black Friday sales, obviously a lot bigger for us for that particular week. And I'd come in and help him and, from nine to five, we were packing boxes. And after that week, I'm like, I'm never doing this again. <laughs> oh, dude, I hear, I hear about founders packing orders for like a year, two years. I'm like, fuck, I did it for like maybe four months. Yeah, that's good. Oh, actually less. Good on you. But like. You probably grew quite quickly though, We grew, right? we grew, yeah, we grew yeah. really quickly. Um, but it's like for the first month, we, and this is, I want to ask the next, but when you guys decided to, you know, make it full time and what was the order, but like. We launched in April. My whole goal for the year of 2018 was to be able to, me and George were like, we just want to be able to quit our jobs and do this full time. We had to do that within a month. And then we, we so we quit our, our jobs, but we still had to give the notice. So like for that four week period, we're doing our full time jobs, meeting up at like 7 p.m. and packing orders to like 2 a.m. and then having to wake up at like 6 a.m. and go to work. So I'm like, fuck, that was rough. Yeah. But what, what was the, because it's always such an exciting moment for anyone that listens, like their dream is just, Obviously, I want to make millions of dollars, but first step, I just want to work for myself. You said Ollie was was working on it more full time at the start. At what point did you start pulling the trigger and each of you coming in full time? And how, what was going through your mind when you left behind the safety of like these big jobs? Yeah, so um, so Ollie started first. Um, he was on it for pretty much a full year or a year and a half. Um, I then joined afterwards. Um. I actually joined because I got made redundant during COVID. Oh, perfect timing. <laughs> so that was a perfect timing kind of thing. Uh, and then six months later, Fidel joined right at the end. So I think at that point, um, the business is doing quite well. Uh, and we just thought, hey, we just got to pull the trigger. Um, Fidel got a leave of absence. So that kind of allowed him to have a full year of then having the safety to going back. If, 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 if yeah. Um, and then, yeah. And then after that, we just went full trigger. What do you think is the hardest part about like what you guys do, like being the founder so young, like in, in our twenties, running businesses, doing really like good, good numbers. Come, there comes a pressure with that. You know what I mean? How, how, how do you manage that? Yeah, I think um, it's something that's, you know, you're not really taught that anywhere. Um, you know, there's, there's definitely a lot of pressure on our shoulders. We've got, we've got a, a huge growing team now. Um, so I think, one of the one of the probably the hardest things for us is we're the ones that I guess every Monday morning bring the energy. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think you know whatever's happening in the business, whether it's a iOS, whether it's a COVID, whether it's whatever <laughs> event dr- throughout the year, um, it's it's very important for us to I guess be the the light at the end of the tunnel for the for the team. Um, and I think just learning how to manage our own I guess emotional state. And also generally, you know, I don't think it, any of us really had an extensive amount of managerial experience. Um, you know, I was at Big Four for three or four years. You only just start kind of scratching that surface. Um, so I think just generally that probably one of the hardest things in the, and the thing we had to learn quickest about was just how to manage people, how to motivate people. Um, you know, people are everything in the business. Uh, they are 100% the reason why we're growing as fast as we are. And I think it's just, it's figuring out what are their wants and needs? What do they want in their career? And just trying to tailor, I guess, their experience and their time at, at Haybud to what they're actually driven by. Yeah, man, that's so true because like so young, even if you did, even if there was a course on it, it you can't just read how to do this. And like I had, I was the same. I was 24 and 24 when we launched the business by like a year and a half in, we had like 12 staff already. I'm like 25 years old. I had no like even proper corporate experience. I had corporate experience, but it was sales. So I'm like, I'm just managing myself. And then it's like learning that people are motivated in different ways. And it sounds so obvious, mm-hmm. motivated in different ways than you. And you have to communicate very differently to, to get the best out of everyone was such a hard thing to learn when you're so young. Um, I want to ask as well, going back a little bit, you were talking about some of those high potent, like those failed products, the successful one. Do you guys now have a criteria that you look at when you're going to launch a product? Like what's a high potential product if you're going to build a new business? Because I think there's a lot of business ideas. There's hundreds of thousands of products people could build a business around. What do you kind of look out for in a good product? 
Yeah, for sure. So we've really developed this process over the past couple of years. Started off a lot more scrappy. Now it's um, very succinct, um, but it starts off with a bit of a research phase. So looking at the market, looking at um, market research, but then combining that a lot more so by having a customer centric approach. So we have post-purchase surveys, we email our customers, um, we have a Facebook VIP group where there's people posting kind of every single day. Um, and we're constantly asking them, hey, what are you guys after? Or if we have a suggestion, we put that forward. Then we test that with the market and we look at, okay, what certain ingredients or products are trending and why. So for example, um, you know, one of the things you can see within the skincare market is sunscreens are really trending and you see all the uh, sunscreen brands just absolutely blowing up. So that's something you have to pay attention to as well. From the natural side of things, mushrooms are growing from the US. So you know that within a couple of years, it's going to be a big thing here. It's the same that thing that happened with hemp. Hemp was big in the US, then came here. Um, so combining with a customer centric and then as well as a market research. Um, and then after that, uh, we, um, I read this good book. Um, I think it's got scaling from like zero to a hundred or something like that million. Um, it's all about, you don't necessarily know what the hero products are going to be. So the idea is out, try to come out with more products because it's the ones you probably don't suspect that are going to be the ones that become the hero products. Yeah. Interesting. I wanted to ask you guys about that because obviously you started with the hero product, the, the, the mask and yeah. you've killed it with that. Have you launched another product since then that's overtaken the mask in sales or is that still number one? Yeah. So the mask, um, yeah, absolutely. was the, the key acquisition one for a long while. It's actually balanced out massively. Wow. That's um, exciting though. That's a good time. It's time. really good. Um, and it's actually done a nice even spread. It's not necessarily one product that's come and taken all the market share from the clay mask, but more so like we've got the cleanser, uh, the gel moisturizer and the niacinamide just have all gone up. I think that's also for the fact that we, um, a lot of our strategies about selling skincare routines to people. So skincare is really complex when people go to the supermarket and they're like, what do I buy? There's a million different products here. We do a lot of different like pack regimes. So if you're an acne prone skin, oily skin or dry or something like that, we've got a particular solution of like, use these three products in these particular steps. And you should expect these kind of results within four to six weeks. In that way, then people try out these, these bundles. And then after that go, Ooh, I really like those two products. So I'll buy those two. And then I'll try these other two as well. Yeah. Makes a lot of sense. Now that's where you're at today. And it obviously the more, you know, space you can own in someone's skincare routine the better it's going to be. But going back to just when you have one product, the, the clay mask, how do you get, you mentioned Ollie was working full-time for about a year by himself. You guys obviously helping out a lot, but full-time, how did you get to that first hundred K? Because that's obviously the hardest hundred thousand a business is ever going to make. What were you doing then? Cause we'll get into 2023 and what marketing looks like these days, but how did you just get to that first hundred K? Cause if, if a lot of people could just get to that number, they feel like their life would change. So Whoever you take it, take it away. Yeah. I mean, I can kick it off, but I think when I look back at when we started, one of the first things we did was obviously um, take a mass micro influencer approach, mm. like a lot of other brands as well. Um, for us, you know, again, we couldn't afford um, to, to send any of those products. We couldn't afford for the pick and pack. So at the start, it was literally us driving around. <sighs> Um, I think we delivered the first thousand orders, um, yeah. first thousand micro influencer orders, um, driving around Melbourne, obviously had to be hopefully as close to the city, but we did end up in the likes <laughs> of Rosebud and, you know, anywhere uh, yeah. within Melbourne. But yeah, for us, the, the first, when I, when I think back to when we launched was micro influencers, that was the first thing we did. We needed content. Um, we needed that brand awareness. We need people trying the product, giving us feedback. And so the micro influencer approach was a was a really easy one. Um, obviously, a little bit more expensive, and so yeah, a lot of that first five hundred units that we that we got um, was straight was straight to the micro influencers, getting that content through um, and going from there, and and that that pretty much led us to um, the the first hundred k in sales. From there, we started to layer on obviously a lot of other marketing initiatives, Facebook, Google, all that all those types of things. Um, but I would say micros is, is a, a huge What part percentage of, of the 500 do you reckon you sent out? Because I've seen it work. Like that strategy is really effective. Business is just starting off because you, like to get like a, a good role asset at the start, a brand new business is going to take a while. So you need to bring in the early revenue from other different channels. Yeah, I reckon um, it might have been probably half, more yeah, probably yeah, around nice. half of that straight, straight to micro influencers, sold out on the other 250 really quickly. Um, Obviously, lead times are a real <laughs> yeah. thing, um, so had to wait till January, and that's why we say we we soft launched in, yeah. in August 2019. 
I launched in Jan um, and then we hit the hit the ground running. Well, so I don't want to move past what you just said. You're laughing that you drove around dropping them off. Man, that's what it takes at yeah, the start. Yeah. We don't have a lot of money. That's what it takes. Like you got to be scrappy. You got to be resourceful. You got to do this shit. People laugh and think, oh, that's so funny. That's why he's successful. Those sorts of little things. Yeah. A hundred percent at our scale. I think, you know, a thousand, a thousand units. If it's ten dollars shipping, that's that's ten thousand bucks we just saved there. That's a that's a huge amount of money. Man, I remember we we did some funny things as well. So funny thinking back, like because we we had the same problem. We were selling stock way faster than we could get it, and like because we didn't have a lot of, we spent nearly all our money that we had in the bank to buy the original stock, and we only had one hundred and ten. So we sent out ten, and we we sold one hundred, and we sold out in like the first week, week and a half, and then we take as much money that we'd invest, like we, we'd made. And I'm sure this was a similar process to you. And then you buy as much stock as you can afford. And then, you know, I need some money to market it and everything, but we'd have like customers buy and they wouldn't get the order for like three, four weeks. So we were like, had these cards, um, like handwritten cards and we'd scan them. We were putting in like, lo- like love heart lollipops and like little sorry hey. and like hand mailing <laughs> to everyone, like so stupid. But it's like, it was really appreciated. Those little things at the yeah, start yeah, yeah. are so fucking crucial to get a business off the ground because it's not easy, particularly with now. Like, what do you think you would do differently now um, launching a business? It's a very different landscape. What do you think would be like your core strategy at the start if you were to launch now? Um. Well, yeah, just sort of what Alex touched on, I would just make sure that um, it's a product that people, it, it solves a problem and people mm-hmm. want it. Um, that would be the core thing. And then um, if we were doing it now, um, definitely just using micro influencers as an awareness piece. I don't think it drives um, sales anymore like it used to. Um, and then just making sure that you learn everything from day one. I think that really helped us. Um, I think Fidel took it took a massive learning it with Facebook ads. I think um, from day one, even we were initially starting off running our own ads and then it just made it really possible to then handball it off to an agency and know what they're doing rather than just like trusting they're doing the right thing. Um, we actually were aware whether they were doing something wrong, whether they were spending enough time on the account and um, throughout our journey as well with constantly being passing it off to an agency, but then taking it back in house because we knew they weren't doing a good enough job or someone could do it better. What do you prefer? Like, I always feel like if you could get the best talent, like if you get a gun digital, like marketer paid media guy, I'd love to have them in house, but to get them, they're starting to really know their worth and it's difficult difficult to, you know, get them. They all start their own business or their own agencies. What if what's worked best for you guys? What do you prefer? What's the preferred? You know, I think we're all, we're always jumping between the two. Mm -hmm. Um, and it depends what business era as well. So we have jumped between agency and in-house many, many times. (laughs) Do you still run them Fidel when it's in-house or do you have someone else that you kind of help? Yeah, at the moment. Um, so we, what we did was we, brought in an ad buyer in-house um, to do, because we we test a lot of creative. So there's quite a bit of, I guess, admin from that perspective. Um, so we brought in a, an ad buyer. Um, and so I just run, like, look over most of the strategy these days, um, mm. not specifically inside the ad account, but on a, on a weekly basis, pulling all the data and kind of just doing an analysis from there. What creatives do you feel like are working the best now nowadays? Yeah, I think, um, you know, for us, one thing that's always going to work is sale creatives, product launch creatives, all that type of stuff. So a big focus for us is how are we creating evergreen ads? Um, evergreen ads are for, for anyone that doesn't know is um, obviously ads that can last 12 months, um, can, can last all year round. Um, so at the moment, UGC is always working. Um, I think one of the interesting things is, you know, you'll see a lot of brands um, trying to do that professional photo shoot, trying to do all those things. And, and we've gone down that path as well many, many times. Um, unfortunately, a lot, a lot of the time, it's, it's that one micro influencer that's you know, speaking truly, uh, just really authentically about the brand um, that does the best. So right now, and I think this has been the answer for quite some time, so it's not a very uh, exciting answer, but UGC always works. Um, and just thinking about those evergreen offers if we can create, um, if we can constantly create new offers for our customers, we know that they're always going to work. So whether it's a bundle and save, whether it's a, um, you know, two for one or, or what, whatever that might be, 
Um, that's what we've found works really, really well, especially in a climate like we are today. Yeah, I jump on top of that as well. Um, I think also what's really starting to happen is well, a bit of a shift in the market as the marketing is starting to tighten up and the economy is getting a little bit worse. There's a big, I think, rise in um, having a very key kind of problem solution type of creative where, you know, the fluffiness of brand, I believe, is kind of going downhill a little bit um, where people, are, if they're spending some sort of money, it has to solve their problem. So I think if you can really clearly articulate that on a creative um, and then back that up by social proof, credibility, reviews, I think those do really well as well. Yeah, we've always, from from the start, even to, to this day, uh, salesy creative direct like straight to the point what's the what's the what's the offer what's the problem what's the solution rather than all this like you said really nice fluffy branding stuff for us it's even more important so if you have a business that is like a, a, a more of a one-off purchase like a, a, some sort of a device like everyone tells you like all, all these old marketing gurus and what they used to teach you when i was working in corporate and marketing and sales like, uh, you, like if, if you if you have if, if you have a sale on too long, like people aren't going to come back. They're only going to expect this. If you like in ecom, it doesn't work like that. Like, bro, someone buys our our, our product once. Like the in our ecosystem, if, if they haven't purchased within two weeks, it's like less than two percent of our customers purchase outside that two. Like, it's ninety percent are in the day day zero or day one. Mm. So it's like you need to go after them and get them, particularly with ecom, because there's so much competition and like so many people will come in and try undercut your prices. You really need to be direct and to the point, and. Sometimes that's going against what certain people say, but it's worked so well for us. Being more direct, that real DR style copywriting has always worked really, really well for us. Now, you mentioned, Ollie, like influencers don't really convert as much as they used to. What sort of role do you play now? Obviously, you said the awareness piece, but I feel like it's way harder. Like you could almost put a product in anyone's hand and they do a good picture and a nice caption and it would sell, but it's like, the percentage of micro influencers or influencers that really drive ROI, I feel like is so much less. And it's only those ones, like you were saying, Fidel, if they really get that right message, that authentic, the authentic, authenticity, that right message, and they can, one of the advantages now is we have like reels and TikTok and people with a couple thousand followers can get a couple hundred thousand views that can work. But what's the strategy that influencers play for you guys today is more of an established brand. Uh, exactly what Fidel touched on before, just sort of content. We, we, We'll send to them. Um, we've even whitelisted a few of the more powerful ones that are great with content um, that has worked well. Um, but even those those influences, um, uh, it sort of runs its course. And yeah. we've we've gone through some whitelisted creators that have boomed for six six months, and then um, unfortunately, it sort of just stops working after after an amount of time. Um, but mainly just content we use influencers for these days and awareness. I, th I think as well there, um, not that we've tried this yet, but I think um, what I'm seeing in the market is uh, there's a rise of these really influencer led brands. And as long as it is quite authentic. So for example, I don't even know, Logan Paul, him and this other uh, influencer in the UK called um, KSI created a hydration brand. And within a year um, it's done 250 million Crazy. Uh, in sales. And so I think there's a rise if you can find the, a really big macro that really makes sense from an authentic point of view, um, that can make a lot of mm. sense and it, it works quite well for brands, uh, but it's hard to get that. And fun fact, we've actually only ever paid one macro influencer. Wow. So yeah, yeah, yeah. it is That's something mental. that we, yeah, we definitely don't. Um, it's, it's becoming part of the strategy now, um, but we're building, yeah, we've never actually, I think we, we had one bad taste of it. Yeah. Um, and, and from there we, we just struggled to kind of understand, I guess the power of it. Um, but what we do want to look into more as we move into this year, and especially as we become more and more of an omni-channel brand, um, is working with, um, you know, ma not macros, but ambassadors, yeah. you know, maybe they're, they're actually celebrities as opposed to, to, you know, just a Instagram famous individual. So, yeah, it's so interesting how it's different. Like we've we would, I reckon we've paid 300 influencers and it's worked really well for us. But like, like you said, things, the landscape changes a lot. So we'd be a lot more selective. And what we didn't do at the start was a lot of micro influencers. Now we're doing a lot more of that. But like for us, do you guys have the issue of like, I suppose it's different. Like your cost of goods are going to be way less than ours. You send to influencers and like, they just won't post ever. Now I'm whatever. I've been doing this for so long. I don't care, but everyone always starts a business. They send me messages oh, this influence isn't posting. What do I do? I'm like, 40% of our people don't post, right? That's, that's a big, a big number. Start. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And we send to about 60 to 70 a week. Wow. So 
unfortunately, I think it's just a part of the game. Um, there are certain things you can try to to minimize that, but at the end of the day, like, yeah, luckily we do have a low cost of goods, and yeah. so like, hey, even if it works for them, and they mention it to one friend who then tries it out, it's worth it. Yeah, yeah, that's crazy. Forty percent, forty percent. Wow. And that's when they actually have it in their hand. So we've got, it's not 40% respond to us, 40%, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. 40% have the product and then don't post with, it. With you guys, maybe this is, well, it's a question for all of you, but um, your brand, how do you, like with, when, you're, when you're scaling your, your campaigns, obviously you're a brand that compared to us, you're going to have a lot more LTV. So it's like, you can run, like there's brands that run at a loss or run at a break even for that first purchase because they know a customer, while it might cost, you know, $40 to acquire, they're all worth at the lifetime, 90, 100, 110. Is that something that you guys have had to shift, like where you set your ROAS targets now that you're a bigger, more established brand, you have more repeat customers? How did how did you go through that process? What's that like for you guys? Yeah, I think um, it's, it's a great question. I think especially how um, what is happening to all paid media over the course of the last kind of 18 months, it's something that we definitely have to consider. A lot of the time, very fortunately, we are profitable on that first purchase um, and it's something that we try to optimize for. Um, however, I think as we build um, you know, different tolerances to and different strategies you know, with Priceline in the picture, all those types of things, um, we are shifting the way that we think about it and the way that we're marketing online. Um, and so you know, moving towards that break-even number is completely fine in this scenario. Ask me 12 months ago, absolutely not. Yeah. <laughs> and that's the thing that that's 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 the challenge. Like you have to you have to be really on it these days when you launch a brand because the mart the it's not as easy to get the ROAS numbers that you used to get before. But if you can establish yourself, I feel like you can get a really good foothold. It's just getting to that point where you've got your, you know, you've got your face out there enough. People know who you are and you're gonna get some repeat business is gonna really help. But I know amazing operators that took them four, five, six months to start being profitable. And like, not everyone can get through that period. A hundred percent. And just to be clear, our ads did not work at the start. Mm. Like it was, it was a hundred percent about building that mass awareness across everyone, getting those testimonials in, getting those customer reviews, the content. Um, You know, we build, we love to build uh, reviews on third party platform sites. All of that um, social proof uh, is definitely necessary to help facilitate those ads. So I would say, if your ads aren't working from day one, don't give up on them. There's a lot that goes into, you know, making um, your ads successful. successful. Um, and yeah, just keep pushing. Exactly right. Testing is so important in e-com. What role, and I don't mind who takes this, whoever feels, feels like Oli, what role does testing play in your business? Obviously, let's talk like in terms of ads, website, we spoke about products, but in terms of ads and website, like your ads are what's bringing people to your websites, what's converting, they're like, that's your storefront, so important. What role does testing play for Haybud? Um, day one of our website, our website was atrocious. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I built the website and then, um, slowly as we've gone on with AB tested, we've done a lot of CRO on our website, which has helped a lot. Um, and our website does convert significantly better than it used to. Um, as well as just like offer it, the offers that we have on the website, we're constantly testing them, whether it's the freebies that we're giving out as well. Um, from an ad perspective? Um, I think from an ad perspective, it's crucial to be testing a lot. Um, And it's not always about volume. So I think it is about critically thinking about the angle, the positioning, the offers, the landing pages, the the funnel, um, whatever that looks like. But, you know, there was a time again, 12 months ago, where uh, I think everyone, every guru was saying, you know, just test a hundred, thousand things a, a week and you know you'll come across something and, and just throw everything at the wall but um as we're maturing it's it's that critical thought towards you know what is going to actually work for our consumer um we have so much data about who our consumer is at this point um and so yeah it's 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 a bit easier for us to create creative and, and test we do still have very high volume and i think when we think about international that's where we probably take more of the um, volume approach. We probably don't know our international car- customer as well as our Australian um, and New Zealand customers. Um, so yeah, vo- uh, creative testing is integral. Um, you know, we have multiple meetings a week. We're testing. We, we've got the budget to do it. This is why it's a high number, but we do uh, test between 50 and 100 creatives a week. Um, 
but only test based on the budget that you have yeah. as well. That's a that's a big part. If yeah. you if you're spending one dollar, don't go test hundred <laughs> yeah. It makes no sense. What what do you think the most successful marketing campaign you've ever ran has been? Uh a couple. Um one of the ones is the most basic creative ever. Um to, which is funny, right? Uh but it's it was essentially a, a bundle shot of three particular products um, with some key call ads over the top. And that ad ran for about six to 12 months being the absolute winner uh. and absorbed about 80% of the budget for a long time. Um, and I would call it like an ugly ad. And for some reason, yeah, that was just a killer. Yeah, interesting. See, for, for ours, it's been so different. Like all of our three biggest ones are completely different categories. Like we had one that, that was really high production value. We spent like... Uh, you know, like UG, this was like right at the start where UGC was starting to like really be the thing, but we spent, we spent 60 grand on a shirt. Uh, 60 grand? 60 grand on a shirt. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and we got like, there was, there was a lot, but essentially there was nine pieces of creative. Eight of them were shit. One of them made us like, fuck, 4 million off one ad we ran. Yeah. So it's like, you don't know, like we... So many bad, uh, not bad, they just didn't work. Like they look good, like it's hitting what you'd want to say, but it's just the timing, the whatever, the algorithm at the time. One out of the nine worked and it made us that much money. But like if that one ad wasn't there, that would have been a waste of $60,000. $60, and this is like, yeah, that would have hurt. I remember you guys, Um, I felt like you guys were one of the first to have the a lot of the after effects on your ads. Yeah. That was quite cool, I remember. Yeah, like, and then everyone started really copying that after. Yeah. Then <laughs> everyone's like, does it work? But what do you think for you guys? Bit of a segue. What do you think for you guys was like one of the biggest, maybe Ollie's good to speak about this one, biggest money wasting exercises or things that you tried because there's a really important lesson in that. Um. Well, yeah, our, our money, where, where we're wasting money is probably on those shoots as well. So <laughs> yeah. the, we just spent a ton on like a recent shoot and maybe it wasn't directed to our audience, mm -hmm. um, whether it was maybe hiring the wrong models or um, – maybe just like that demographic of person we weren't um, particularly targeting in those ads. And I think because we were trying to shift into a different audience um, and I think we're sort of starting to realize that we should just probably stay within the audience that we're currently in. I think another one I'll add to that as well. Is, um, it's funny, like having that, like you always have that frugality mentality um, of trying to go like very low cost. That's actually also cost us as well. So sure. sometimes we've gone for like the cheapest people like the cheapest web developers and then the entire website screws up There's certain and things. we lose like something like that because we wanted to save an extra 2k so that's something we've had to shift as well as like what you pay for is what you get um yeah dude oh, i've learned that in so many things not just business like just in yeah. life like it's like yeah i don't like just throwing money at problems because if you do that for too long it's a recipe for disaster but i think picking your moments and knowing when's the time to you know be frugal when's the time to really maybe push out the boat a little bit more because you know, you're going to get the best, um, you're going to get the best final product. And I think like when you have so many things going on, sometimes just paying that little bit more for the peace of mind is definitely worth it. Um, the moment I wanted to ask you guys about, because it's what gets everyone G'd up just thinking about it. But it's like, do you guys remember where you were or the day that you realized that, holy shit, like this is, this is a real thing. Like I was it your first million. Was it whatever? Like, do you remember when was that moment? Paint the picture of when you guys looked at each other and like, this is fucking, this is actually doing really well. This is exciting now. Yeah. It's, I want to hear, if you all have different yeah, yeah. answers, that'll be even better. My one's a funny one. Um, it was when, when we started the business, obviously MVP, you know, just minimal viable product, get it out there you know, 500 units, whatnot. Um, and I remember buying our insurance. <laughs> I remember buying our insurance and it was forecasting the year, year ahead. And I think we bought like $50,000 worth of, of coverage of insurance. And I think when we actually came time, you know, we started selling, selling really fast. And then all of a sudden we're like, oh crap, we're not actually insured. <laughs> um, and upgrading that insurance from where we were kind of to, to where we were going, um, I think was a, a huge kind of, Oh my God, that's where my, that's where my brain was previously. That's what I thought was possible previously. And now kind of what we're achieving is, is what is possible, which was like the biggest shift in my brain. Yeah. Yeah. Mine's probably even before that. Um, <laughs> mine was probably, um, 
when we had our first micro influencer post and we actually got a sale off it. Wow. And I remember um, like the second and third day, we just got no sales. And so, like, <laughs> Um, and yeah, oh, I remember. I remember our first sale. Jenny Hayes, still remember her name. We popped a bottle of champagne. We celebrated. <laughs> but I remember, like, I don't know if you guys had this moment. I've, maybe it was different because it happened so quickly for for us. I was because this was my first business, Happy Skin, and like I was still working that that say that corporate sales job, and like my best mate at work, and like we showing him like like look at this, this is fucking crazy, man. Like I was earning probably like. A grand a week at that point and now like our third day we made like five and a half grand and then like we sold out in like a week and a half i was like all this stuff was happening we were selling 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 we had to quit our jobs just to be able to do the work because it also happened so fast you're like oh you don't know is it really gonna last and then i remember it was probably like once we got our once we got our warehouse and our full-time staff and we were in there for a couple months i'm like okay this is actually normal life now and it's like a big and I always always envisioned like having like an exciting life and, and doing something like worthwhile and big. But like once I like once I found that and I felt so good in that moment, I feel like if 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 I could give that moment to to everyone, I would. For us, it was probably six months in we started paying ourselves like a, a proper wage. But like there was we did so much in six months. It's not just about like and that's the e-com generation, especially the younger the younger ones. They want they want their Lambo, they want their Rolex straight away. It's like that's not really how it works but if you stay disciplined and be focused then you can definitely make um you can definitely change your life through e-commerce now this discipline and motivations to two things like the kind of two schools of thought what do you feel like is core to you maybe this is more of a personal question to each one of you guys like do you guys feel like you work better when you generate motivation for yourself that's how i work i like to always be connected to my goals why i'm doing things why i'm excited about it whereas some people are like i don't care how i feel i'm just going to be disciplined and do the work anyway which school or, or which school of thought do you kind of lean into more? Um, yeah, probably just discipline mm-hmm. um, and just making sure, you know, you're, you're doing your role and you're not letting letting anyone down as well. I thought you'd say discipline. <laughs> <laughs> Fidel, what about you? Um, I would say, yeah, I think I lean more on the, the, like the work ethic, discipline, consistency side. Um, I always joke, I feel like I'm not really in touch with like my own body sometimes. And so it's, it's, you know, yeah, I I think I would agree with that. Yeah. Yeah. You definitely need both. You definitely need discipline. And there's going to be moments has been fucking countless for me that like you're doing the, it's like 2am for, for, for you guys, it's cool that like there's three of you guys in the, in the highs and the lows, you get to share those moments for me. Um, it's been just me for like the last four years. So it's like, Sometimes I'm in the office at like 2 a.m. by yourself trying to figure out all this stuff, getting it done. And you're like, oh, fuck, I really wish I didn't have to be doing this right now. But it's those moments when like I almost start feeling sorry for myself a little bit. And I'm like, no, this is what makes someone successful. When you can work through and push through these moments, that's what makes someone, you know, successful. It's not going to be easy. There's no business that's like hasn't gone through any challenges to, to be, get where they were today. I remember like the first time that like we'd go through a down period Something what the fuck like you should, like no you don't I, I never panic I never panic but you see, in the back of your head you're starting oh shit like so like so many businesses end up failing but it's like once you go through the ups and downs a couple of times you realize it's it's exactly that you have to adjust and you have to always always pivot and then like mm-hmm. that you go come back up and then you'll have like six months where it's killing it then all of a sudden something changes one thing you don't even know about algorithm change iOS shipping you know what I mean and all of a sudden you take a dip. What do you do to get through those moments? Obviously adjust, but like, what do you do to like keep yourself like figuring out, like we just got to get through this because every business is going to go through the ups and downs. I would just, the first thing I would say there is, um, you know, when those times come around, um, they consume our headspace. There's, there's no doubt. Um, we have been able to obviously um, improve the way that we deal with those scenarios. And I think it, it's, it's funny because every time it happens, you look back and you're like, thank you. Thank you so much for happening. True, yeah. Um, because I honestly, and I know it's the same for all three of us, we get so much better during those times. And for us, the thing that helps me the most is pull it back to the fundamentals. Like forget it. There's so much going on. Um, a lot of the time, 80% of what's going on, you know, doesn't need to be going on. And it's the 20, like how do you focus on the 20% of the business that's going to make uh, the biggest impact on the business. So when we start to, you know, when 
when shit hits the fan, it's like, okay, wait, wait, wait. Let's look at these four, you know, four things, these four levers of growth. Which one's no, not switched on? Which one do we need to push harder on? Where do we pivot? So I think for, for so long, um, you know, I would try and counteract those bad times with just like more work and more push more and like go harder. Um, but I think it's actually breathe, obviously breathing stepping back, looking at the foundations of the business and the fundamentals of the business, and then making sure you're making um, very informed decisions from there. Mm. Yeah. It's about those high, like high profit actions. You know what I mean? Like 80% of your money going to come from 20% of your actions. And I feel like it's, it's a term that gets thrown around a lot, but a lot of people, particularly in e-com, because the to-do list, you can always do something else. There's always something to test to try to fix. Like, people get busy being busy a lot. Mm. And it's like, what? All right. <laughs> let, let me just pause that for a moment. What's really, and not, not about like getting funky. It's like going back to basic, what brings in the money for the business yep. is, is one. Yep. How do we do that better? And how do we do more, more of that? And then two, what, what I've learned in some of those situations, like where are we wasting money? Mm. And then a lot of people, if you haven't gone back, if it's been a year and you haven't gone back and looked at what's coming out of your bank account and looked at your P&L properly, you realize you're wasting so much money, guarantee it. That's what we've got, Ali. So we're all good. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, oh yeah, that, that doesn't happen for more than a day. Yeah, yeah. I, um, I actually always say as well, um, so I was an accountant by trade for four years mm. um, and I'm, I'm CA qualified. Um, I've actually never graduated, but I have done all the <laughs> tests. I've done all the tests ready for graduation, but you have to start paying an annual fee, which I'm not ready for. <laughs> um, but I always say that I've never actually learned accounting until I started my own business. Oh yeah. And then when times are s- stressful, it's like I've done a master's degree in accounting yeah. <laughs> within a couple of weeks. So yeah. I think as well, um, what happens over time and as you grow and get bigger, I think one of the biggest problems for a lot of businesses is shiny object syndrome. Mm-hmm. So the bigger you get, the bigger that opportunities come, the more people you have, the more that your attention gets diverted into so many different areas. And it's really kind of coming back to what you were saying is tr- really be able to focus and realize what are the key levers to pull and what to focus on. Cause there's always a, someone presenting, you know, where it's a cold email being like, Hey, I've got the next big thing. Yeah. And then you're like, Oh shit, maybe we should try that. But it's never that. Yeah. Have, has there been, this is, um like, have, have you come across anything as I mentioned before that one email reply to ended up making me a lot of money. Um, but has there been some software or tool or anything that you've tried or tested and brought into the business that has been a bit of a game changer for you in terms of like an, an e-com site, anything like that? Probably one of the the biggest tools I'd say. So we have this tool called Lifetimely um, and it integrates all your financials and allows you to kind of look at uh, your profit and loss on a daily basis. That's hooked up to all of your ad spend. That's, That's cool. super beneficial to see like, you know, what's your new customer role as, how much of your revenues from repeat revenue. Um, and then you can quickly make decisions and realize, you know, I, one of the biggest things I feel like all the time within business is identifying where the problem is or where the bottleneck is and putting all your attention there. So that kind of software allows us to really quickly identify where the problem is and solve it. I'll, I'll jump in there. Um, one platform that we've used religiously for the last like 18 months is Linkby. Mm-hmm. That's where we work really well. Um, it's, just a PR platform that helps you get into all the articles and that's that's helped massively with the social proof on the website um, and drive an insane amount of traffic to our website. Has that worked as mainly an awareness piece or do you get some actual ROI from that as well? We we only work off the ROI on that. Yeah, um, nice. And so the, the main sort of performance for us have been sort of like BuzzFeed, mm-hmm. Daily Mail, um, a few others like mirror.co.uk mm-hmm. as well as um, some other. On that tech stuff, have you guys, like when all the iOS stuff happened, did you guys, have you guys use like any like the triple A or high row stuff? Did that work for you guys or? Yeah, absolutely. Um, we've used both. Uh, so for a long time, we were using high rows. Triple A obviously came around, um, a nice interface and stuff like that. Um, but we're in it daily. It has it definitely helped the business. Um, you know, we, we pretty much don't look inside um the platforms anymore and yeah. we, we make all our decisions based on uh triple whale or hyro so it's it's helped a lot yeah yeah again that might not be someone just starting out we'll have the budget for that but <laughs> yeah, absolutely not <laughs> <laughs> and I, absolutely yeah. not and and that's a good point um i think it's it's i know a lot of people who are doing really well still working inside the facebook mm-hmm. platform um you know, again, we, we have a pretty large marketing budget. And so at that point it, it makes a lot of sense for us, but, um, yeah, I, I think 
you can still be very successful looking inside the the Facebook budget because again, um, if if your ads within the the platform are getting learnings, like that does mean a lot as well. Even though even if those other plugins like Triple Whale aren't showing those sales, yeah, and and it's tricky. Like when we started the business, the detailed reporting and and the accuracy of it was so good. It was good. That's like, it was great. You could yeah, find yeah, a yeah. single ad creative that had a high rise and I could spend 10 grand on it a day and just watch until the rise start dropping down. Like <laughs> yeah. that was, those are the days, man. Um, but I want to ask you, getting onto that next level of growth, how long ago did you guys launch into price on? It was relatively recently, right? November. November. Well, congrats on yeah. that. Obviously massive deal. Talk to me about that process. What, what made you want to make the decision to move into retail? Yeah, definitely. So, um, we uh for us to get into the retail space was a was a pretty long journey and started about two to three years ago, probably two years ago. Um, so we we reached out to someone um pretty early days, like two years ago, for a distribution partner to to be able to help us get into the different pharmacy space. Uh that person at the time thought that our brand was a little bit too small. Uh, but he thought he actually really liked our business. And so he actually became a strategic investor into our business. Um, and so that was a really good segue where he, um, professionalized the business massively, um, built us up, uh, help us built us up to a point where, um, he had all the right connections into pharmacies and whatnot. And so that allowed us, um, the transition to retail, uh, a lot smoother than for a lot of other brands as well. Also, when we're looking at our customer profile, we actually looked that, um, our pharmacy customer is very similar to our online customer. And a lot of our customers were asking us to, um, to be in retailers. Cause you know, for some people that are living a little bit more rural, it's a little bit harder for, for shipping and postage to get to them. So, um, we wanted to have a particular, retail partner that worked from a customer perspective, but also had a very um, large uh, footprint in terms of Australia as well. Yeah. It's funny. It took a couple of years. It's always going to take a couple of years. Like unless you somehow yeah, yeah, yeah. time it, like you're never going to get into retail yep. quickly. Um, now I want to, we'll, we'll move towards the like wrapping it up, but I do want to get into you guys head and ask you some questions just about your thoughts uh, on, on the future of e-com and some different things. But the first one I want to get, get your opinion on if, if you, you don't have to all answer, but if, if you've got something to say, please jump in. What's, what's one thing that you, you've learned over the years that you wish you knew at the start? What do you think would have been a game changer that you know now that you didn't know at the start? Yeah. I, I, two things I would say to, to focus on if I was talking to my younger self. Um, one is, uh, is, is play the long game. So uh, nothing happens instantly um, and you're going to be eating shit for a long time. And then the, the second part of it is uh, – is seek assistance. I think, especially yeah. when you're a little bit younger, um, people respond to to people's curiosity a lot more these days. Um, and we had so many people that essentially were big mentors of ours um, early days. I know you had um, Ben Goodman on here. So he was a bit of a mentor oh, for us cool. early yeah, days. He's a legend, super smart guy. Yeah, yeah he's, he's incredible. Guy. So he helped us a lot. He actually taught us Facebook ads. Yeah. Um, and so people like him and others came along the journey, taught us something which then, you know, allowed us to learn something else, which then segued onto that. So I think, a mixture of persistence and just continuously trying um, folk uh, also accompanied with um, talking to other people that have more experience than yourselves gives a pretty good chance or increases the probability of success. For sure. For sure. Yeah. I'll just say the last one then. I think we might've touched on it earlier, but um, don't be afraid and um, to learn the actual skills of the business. Don't always rely mm. on agencies. Yeah. I think we brought the example before learning Facebook ads was a, fairly big game changer for us. Um, but it could be any part of the business. Um, we still, we had to learn how to print labels. We had to learn how to pack boxes. We had to learn how to run the ads, how to do everything, how to run, you know, set up an email flow, whatever it could be. So I think, yeah, not having, especially in the early days, not having that over-reliance on, on any one agency or number of agencies and you get so much more value if you just spend one to two weeks learning a, a skill set um, that will serve you for the rest of your business. Yeah, Ali. Um, but yeah, just to touch on Fidel's point. Um, it's crazy how many times people reach out to you just over like something tiny, like someone someone will reach out to you being like, "How do I set up and print the labels?" And it's like you're using our time just to sort of ask us something that you can just easily learn yourself. Yeah, <laughs> and and you already know that person's not going to succeed if they were already like reaching out over something so Google simple. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we, we get so frustrated when someone asks us something that you can easily find on Google. That's, that's a good point, man. I, yeah. I, um, I've, I've done a lot of mentoring as over, over the years. I'm, 
Yeah, it's like you, you can tell from the type of question someone asks you, like the, it's an indicator of success. Like some people just ask, I, some, someone messaged me like, how? It's how, question mark. I'm like, what do you mean? Like, oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. how do I start a business? I'm like, what do you expect <laughs> me to write in this mess? You know what I mean? Like a lot of it, and I'm so open to helping and, I, I, and, and that's part of what I enjoy now. That's why I like having these conversations so people can hear people that went from everyday life, wanted like working a corporate job, maybe – you know, wasn't going to fulfill them for the life and then changing their lives. So there's a lot of fulfillment in that for me, but it's like, no matter how good your mentors are, no matter how much help you get, if you don't take the initiative yourself, if you didn't have that learning attitude to like, okay, can I just Google something? Or am I going to, you know, find out YouTube, like will teach you so many things on YouTube. You need to be able to take that learning mindset and just try things. Don't be afraid to fail and try it yourself. Cause like you're saying, Fidel yourself, like doing the things yourself, are going to serve you way more than just getting, asking for help every time anyway. Mm -hmm. I think it's a really important part. Now, I already knew this, but having conversation, this is, is this 51? Episode 51. So I've had a lot of really cool, mainly successful people on this um, podcast. And like I was saying before, it's all related to, to, to mindset and, and, and you can't really be successful unless there's something internal within you. Now, what do you think there's one thing each that you've, um, implemented into your life, a habit or a ritual that's allowed you to, you know, unlock like the next level of thinking or the next level of life or business. What would one thing be that it's helped you move forward with life? I would say, and it's a really basic one, but uh, cliches are cliches for a reason. And I'd say learning, um, having a learning approach in all areas of your life, whether it be health, fitness, business, relationships. Um, if you're a keen learner and you're curious and you're willing to ask the right questions, um, it can take you so far in life and improve you in so many different areas. Yeah. Um, Alex has thought this, but um, openness to communication. I think um, previously I probably would have bottled everything up um, and it's so valuable with you know, life, um, relationships and business. Just before Fidel goes, having three people in a business it could kind of be an advantage in terms of like working through like not disagreements, like differences in opinion. How do you guys approach differences in opinion and how do you work through that and, and get to an answer that you're all comfortable with? Actually it works really smoothly because we have three yeah, people. Kind of easy, so huh? usually it's like person A, person B, like having a debate and then person C kind of is very neutral and then yeah. they listen to both arguments. They're not emotional and they go, actually, I understand this person's side and yeah. Because at the end of the day, you all have like the business's best interests. Yeah. Obviously that's the center of the decision, but some people see things differently. So yeah. Yeah. It's good. Fidel, on that last point, is there anything that you've introduced to your life that's helped either you or your business uh, get better results? Yeah. It's um, I think making one of the biggest things for me that works really well is, is time blocking. Um, I'm the more that I'm getting, obviously as the business matures, um, there's just so much going on all the time. Um, and you can find yourself actually achieving nothing in your days. Um, so being able to set, you know, time apart that might be more than necessary to ensure that you can actually get into that deep work. That's probably been the biggest game changer. Um, you know, prior to that, I would let the day lead me. And I, if I can lead the day, um, that, that serves us really well. It's massive. And like you said, like a lot of these things are simple, but mm. they're simple for a reason. It's like the ideas are simple, but actually doing them and being disciplined to your time blocking, not like getting someone, Hey, Fidel, I've got this problem. And then you go and do that. And then you're like, Oh, I've run out of time for that thing now. A hundred percent. And it, it could be like, we obviously come into the office a couple, uh, three times a week. Um, everyone's very close. It's so easy to just kind of lean over and be like, Hey, can I, but you know, we try and make it a rule. You know, if you, if you want to, um, interact or you have a question, try to build the questions up Book in 15 minutes. Let's just smash them all at, all at once. Um, and I think that serves us yeah, really, really well. Yeah. And if I had to ask you guys, if, if you had to name one trait or characteristic that uh, a founder or entrepreneur needed to be successful, what do you think that one trait would be? Probably grit. Yeah. It's tough. It's really tough. And uh, anyone that I've ever come across always shares similar stories of like, it was really hard. It actually, it always is hard, right? It's hard at the start, but then it also gets hard later on. So I think if you have a good level of grit, you can get through it. Yeah. It's hard, but it's fun. Yes. It's worth it. It's yeah, so yeah, worth yeah. it. And like, that's yeah, why I like, I, I like having real conversations about what the process is really like, because I'm not one of those guys flashing my Rolexes and lots of cash. I hate that shit, man. Yeah, yeah. You can make a lot of money from Ecom. You can change your life from Ecom, but realistically, you're going to have to put work in to do that. Mm. If you can surround yourself by, with people that you enjoy working with, it's obviously going to make the process so much more enjoyable. Um, 
few more questions out and then we'll, and we'll wrap this one up. But I want to know, what do you guys see as the future of e-com over the next couple of years? Do you, do you see any changes coming, purchasing behaviors, different channels? What do you guys think of the landscape? Um, yeah, I think it's an interesting, right? Like living through COVID obviously sped up a lot of, uh, mm -hmm. a lot, a lot of things. Um, it seems to have obviously gone a little bit backwards, maybe continued on that original trajectory. Um, e-com is growing. There's no question about it. Um, there's a lot of opportunity in e-com. Um, I think things are constantly changing. Um, you know, Facebook was, you know, the thing 12 months ago, maybe it's not so much now. Um, so I think for me, it's thinking the biggest thing for us is knowing that you know, whatever's happening in the economy is happening. Maybe consumer confidence is a little bit lower. Um, that's definitely going to have uh, an impact in my opinion on, on potentially the trajectory of retail and e-commerce as a whole. Um, but, but overall, I think it's, it's 12 months of potentially hard work, you know, managing budgets, managing cash flow. Um, but after that, I see a lot of opportunity. There's obviously huge opportunity, um, right after potential downturns. Um, so yeah, obviously I think the, the future is very bright. Um, there might be a, a few little interest rates rising and those types of things are a bit of hurdles to get over. Um, but yeah, I think people will continue to, um, shop online that is going to grow. And I think one of the things for us is still diversifying. That's a big, um, I guess, very important to us. Um, we do think that no matter what happens, there's going to be potentially a certain amount of shoppers that continue to go in store um, and that we'll, we'll probably struggle to reach otherwise. Um, so definitely an omni-channel approach I think would, would do you really well. Um, but there's no doubt in my mind that um, e-commerce e will, will continue to grow. I think AI is going to be a big shift. Um, that's something that's very interesting. It's already it here. Like some mm. people are already doing so much with it. Like it's, you know. We use it on a daily basis. Um, it's so good for just assisting your, you know, your day to day, whether it be a bit of copywriting or something like that. Yeah. It's like, yeah. Yeah. I, I use it a lot, but like even how much I use it, like there's so much more. Yeah. Like if you can, if you're just starting off, if you want to dive into AI from the start, it's going to help you do a lot of things that used to take a lot of time yourself. And like you said, like, in terms of the market, yeah, everyone's predicting the market's going to go a little bit bad, but that also means less competition and less new businesses joining joining the space. So it's still an amazing time to to launch a business. Just be prepared to do the work. You know what I mean? To to stick that out. And what I've noticed as well, like when things are going really good, every thousand competitors come in. It's like they all go away really quickly. If you can build a foundation properly, it's going to set you up for success long term. And on that long term piece, I want to get your guys' thoughts on. Drop shipping versus building a brand. <laughs> Obviously, we all fans of building a brand, but talk to me about why why it's uh, a better move than than drop shipping, particularly in today's market. Yeah, well, one of the one of the trends I was actually going to say before, which ties into this conversation as well, is I think there's a big trend towards personalization. Mm. So I think that there are so many new brands and widgets coming out constantly that there's a bit of a paralysis and analysis. Um, for these particular customers buying the product. But if you can do a personalized approach for the particular problem, I think you ended up um, winning. And there's a lot of brands coming up that are actually doing more of these personalized approaches. Um, you know, you're seeing the rise of like skincare quizzes and things like that, where people are looking for a better, uh, for a really particular solution. And that's one thing that dropshipping doesn't have. You're ordering something from the, you know, from the factory over in China or something like that. Um, you don't really have much quality control and therefore you're giving quite a, like a general feel of the experience and you're not customizing it for the experience. I think dropshippers just want to make a quick buck. Like as in the, the, the length of time it takes to build that brand, it was six to 12 months for us, like researching, building out the product. Whereas that, that dropshipping um, method is just, you know, you, you buy something from China you, you ship it out to the customer and um, just the time length to, to do that. I think it's a great learning block initially, but other than that, definitely build your own brand. You can't even really be successful with dropshipping long-term anymore. You can't be unique. I feel like Facebook hardly allows it. Oh yeah. Facebook's going to, has been trying for a couple of years now to do everything it can to get dropshippers off. And obviously I'm all for that. Because, yeah, yeah. You know, <laughs> uh, they, they, uh, they got pretty crazy there for, for, for a little while um, with the amount of drop shippers, but like, it's still a really good, if you don't have a lot of money, like got a lot of DMs, from like 18, 19, 20 year old, like really? just out of school, don't have a lot of money. 
it's, it's like you said, it's really good to learn. It's really good to make a bit of money. So even if you can like bang 10, 20 K profit, it's good. But also what like where I see drop shipping becoming a, a really useful tool now, obviously I didn't do that, but it's like for the people that don't have that much money, if you can get into a product category that obviously you don't have the personalization and the, then the quality control. So there's, there's negatives, drawbacks to it. But if you can find a product that's um, relatively untapped, it's new and you can still you can identify that you don't have, you know, 10 grand, five grand, 20 grand cash to buy the stock. You can start with the drop shipping product with the view to as soon as you can make enough money to then level it up and make mm-hmm. it a brand. But I think long term you need to be in the brand space. Sorry, Fidel, you're gonna say something? Yeah, I just think like for me, that discussion to Ollie's point, I think it's a great learning experience. I think it's whatever pathway gets you quicker to execution and action is the right pathway. Because that means that you're going to learn so much quicker. Um, I think, you know, potentially if you're building a brand, a common potential mistake that people face is um, everything needs to be perfect. And that's not also the right answer either. And so it's figuring out which one gets you to action and execution quicker um, and therefore learnings quicker. Because learnings is the thing that you're really chasing at the end of the day. A hundred percent. Especially if it's your first business or you're just getting into e-com. Mm-hmm. But the days of like, general stores with like a hundred products, just running those that, that people are glued onto that. People don't buy yeah. from that anymore. Um, but yeah, now we've been talking about people like getting in because that's the thing, like we can have these conversations and people listening will have brands, right? But most people just with the, like break down the numbers. Most people that think about business, like they're, they're wanting to get in and wanting to start. But like I mentioned earlier, 90% of people don't actually take their idea and make it something. Do you have a piece of advice for those people that are close that really want it, just haven't had whatever it is, the courage to, to make the leap, take the risk? What would you say to someone to make them, to make them actually do it? It's a funny one. See, I, I feel like uh, you have to really feel it internally. Um, I know that for myself, I couldn't not do it. You know, like I, I couldn't see myself ever working really in the long term. In the court, I mean, you might do it for the short term, but I think you have to have that internal drive yourself to uh, to be able to do it. If someone's looking for uh, for advice to kind of make it, um, I mean, the best thing I can say it's it's definitely worth it, and I'm, and I'm sure you resonate the same thing, and sure. everyone would say the same thing. So it's like if you hear that from all these people, and everyone says just take a stab, you know, go low cost, try find, you know, look at Google Trends, look at Product Hunter, find some problem and find a low cost solution to that and, and give it a shot, then um, yeah, just give it a crack. The, you know, in my industry within accounting, the best outcome was still not what I wanted. You know, if I became mm. partner, if I did all these things, when I really looked at it, it's not what I wanted. And so for us, it was probably a fairly easy decision, but you, you, t- you touched on a word there, which is courage. And I think um, I was listening to a podcast the other day. There is not that much courage in the market generally speaking. And so I would say back yourself, um, be courageous, get out there. There's not that much that can go wrong. You know, for me, it was um, you know, positioning ourselves. I could go back to my job. They would take me back if I quit. Um, and so knowing, you know, take that leap of faith and just having that courage to do it, I think is, uh, is huge. Um, I just think if you need someone, something to push you forward um try to partner up with someone i don't know if whether you'd be here without george initially um without that motivation and we wouldn't be here either. a hundred percent like i've done it both ways now i'm uh i definitely like prefer working with people 100 percent. obviously you own less of the business but who cares yeah you know what i mean like it's more fun it's way more fun the highs yeah. and lows sharing that with people. Like you said, you got the accountability. You don't want to let the other person down. So it makes you show up more often. But like you said, like the savage part of me is just like, how bad do you really want it? Mm. Like ask yourself, cause so many people, and this is meant like the savage, like, do you, do you really want it? Cause so many people talk like, yes, I want to change my life, but do you, cause what have you done to make it happen? So it's like, just sometimes it's like we live in this society and I'm very like, I'm more of a encouraging guy to get people to come on, like think of the good things. But at the end of the day, it's like, fucking, you say you want it. Do you want to change your life? What's the best case scenario if you don't, you know, work at a corporate job to hate, oh, you're a tradie, you hate mm-hmm. it. You're in, even if you earn 150 grand a year, like you get to trade most of your time doing something you don't like. There, there isn't the risk. The risk is not trying. Yeah. Or you lose a few grand. So what? Like if you can just formulate backup plans to like, okay, if X, Y, Z fails, I can live with my parents or I can go back to this job or whatever. The risk is not trying. 
Mm. Right. The risk is not trying. So that's what I, that, that's, yeah, I think, I think all great answers. Um, but I want to ask you some, something as well. Now change of pace before we, before we wrap this up now, something I like to talk about with a lot of people we didn't really get into it today. Cause I just wanted to focus on, um, the business journey. Cause you guys have had some, such an exciting journey, but it's like, I've been reflecting a lot and obviously hearing a lot of podcasts talking about it now, like your childhood are really pivotal years of your life. Now, can any of you identify a moment or an experience in your childhood that you've realized now is like really become a, a core part of who you are? Is that <laughs> something you guys have thought about or am I just throwing this on you? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, I love this kind of stuff. So, yeah. um, yeah, I mean like, both my parents are Eastern European, so they come from Poland um, and they just were very strict from an early age. And so I think like definitely early days, like insecurity dry, like drove me from like not feeling enough and, uh, and, I, and I didn't feel enough when I was in the corporate path and I wanted to prove to myself that I could actually make something of myself. So that was a very big driver for actually doing entrepreneurship over time. Um, then I actually changed that and, uh, and it comes from a much healthier place. But I think I saw a quote from Alex Hormozzi um, recently was like, if you look at the three most common traits from the most successful people, one of them is that kind of like deep um, insecurity from like a, from a young age from your parents. So, yeah. Yeah. Like insecurity can be a great motivator, mm. but as long as it, it can start with that. Yeah. And then. It's like, it's like a dirty, dirty fuel. You yeah, know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, like yeah. it's good maybe to, it's really powerful motivator, but you want to uh, change that for clean energy over time. A hundred percent. Yeah. Fidel. Anything? Yeah. I, I probably don't have anything as powerful as that. I think overall, um, you know, both my parents, um, ran their own businesses. And so I, for me, I hand on heart, I actually never even considered ever working for someone. It wasn't actually until Alex was ap applying for big four that I even knew that that was a possibility. <laughs> like I, and that's just me being very, very naive, but it, for me, like my whole, my whole life, my whole, um, you know, being a child growing up with my parents, it was, you run your own business. That's all you do. I, I didn't know anything else and I, I never envisioned anything else. And so I definitely think that's hundred percent impacted. But kind of the decisions that, I've made. That, that's awesome, man. Mm. And like, that's something to be grateful for. And like, it, it, when I say this question, like it doesn't have to be like a, a, a like a, a, an experience that built an insecurity that made you want to prove it can be something like that. Mm. You know what I mean? The whole uh, entrepreneurs born or bred thing that debate goes around and like, I never thought of, I didn't think about starting my own business until like a year before I did, but that's because of the people are like my, none of know any of my family had businesses I went to school, I went to union to do law. Like I wasn't exposed to any of that. So I always said, nah, like I never wanted to be an entrepreneur. I never thought about that. But now thinking about what I'm like, my traits, my characteristics, what I enjoy, that's exactly what I was meant to do. I just didn't, I just didn't have an example around me to, mm. to look at, to, in, to inspire me, to realize that, hey, you know, someone from my position can do that. Mm. So it's great. Anything for you, Ali? Or? Um, if I had to think about something, it would, would have been probably my obsession with sport when I was younger. Like we, I think um, Alex sort of touched on that we played tennis when we were younger and then soccer, footy, cricket, swimming. Um, and then just business is more of like a sport where you're just trying to constantly win. Yeah. I, it, people have like had Olympic athletes and stuff and they say, I'm just applying the Olympic sport. I, like business is my new sport. Mm. So like that competitive edge, always looking for those 1% as you can do better, how to show up uh, as best you can every day. It, it translates so much. Um Another thing that's a pretty common theme on the podcast to like talk about with a lot of guests is like mental health and optimizing your mental health. It's, it's such an important part, just as much as looking after your health is so you can feel good and have the energy to, to go to work every day. You also need to look after your mental health so you can be able to do that. Because if you're down and, and you get stuck in that run that lasts for several months, it's really difficult to effectively lead a business. What do you guys do like on the day to day to make sure you, you're, you're feeling good? Or have you ever had moments in, in your past where you've struggled with mental health and you've realized that, fuck, I never want to let myself get to that position again. Cause looking back, I, I definitely had that early twenties. And since that point, I realized how serious it is. And, and I never got that low, but I just realized I don't ever want to not feel in control of my emotions and moods. Yeah. For so sure. having that experience, making me realize that is giving me so much more power because I realized it's something you have to actually work on and think about. So now it's, yeah, it's become a massive pillar in, in my life. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I probably had like a small bout of, uh, of burnout towards the end of last year. 
Um, just was a really big year. A lot was going on. Um, so I, this year has been a bit of a year of wellness for me where I've actually quit alcohol for three months. Nice. Um, so far, um, I've been waking up really early in the morning, going to the gym, picked up boxing, things like that. And I find the the more I do that stuff, the more I bring a more like stable, um, clear mind to the business. And then there's less of those, those highs and the lows. It's more just like consistent. That's been a game changer for me. Yeah. But burnout is very real thing. Yeah. You know? I, I think I maybe burnt out recently as well for a bit. I, yeah. I wouldn't say it was full. I've had full burnout once yeah. and I almost got it again recently. And it's like, it's not worth cooking yourself that bad because it's not like, okay, I just take a weekend and off and sleep. If you get to burnout, sometimes it can take weeks or months to fully get back to feeling as energetic, as clear as possible. So making sure you avoid that is really, is really important. Anything for you, Fidel or Ollie? Um, I've recently just been taking a bunch of vitamins, which has helped a lot. Um, I know that on TikTok, um, magnesium glycerate is quite popular at the moment, which I've recently started taking and it's drastically improved my sleep. And, um, which just means that I, I don't get that 3 PM crash anymore, which, and that's just been over the last month. I don't need coffee, which is awesome. Um, but yeah, I think that's helped a lot. Coffee is a big pillar of this Melbourne trip. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, for me, uh, I would, I would cro- closely relate with the burnout. I think, um, there's been t- like, there's no doubt that I don't actually know whether it was burnout or, or what it is, but definitely close to it. Um, and it's, it's, it's very real, uh, for people don't think that you can kind of work 24 hours a day. Um, cause you can't. And I think what led to that was trying to do too much all at once. Um, when there's offline, online people, this, that, the other, and literally the world is your oyster. Um, you could achieve anything you like. Uh, and you can chase as many opportunities as you like, but sometimes it's really about, okay, here are the three things that I just want to chase. How do I build my day around that? And, and for me, um, the way that I, I get that clarity is um, I have a, a, a dog. Um, so every morning walking the dog around, um, around the park and that provides um, a clarity for the rest of the day. Who's, who's the dog's the black dog? I look exactly like my dog. <laughs> I look exactly like my dog. Uh, I was just doing research looking at you guys. So yeah, yeah, yeah. It was one year on your stairs, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Your team photo. Yeah, yeah. Um, what were you saying? I wanted to say something. Um, dog. Nah, before the dog. Uh, burnout being real. I've lost it. All good. <laughs> <laughs> we'll move on. Now I'm gonna I'm gonna steal something from another fucking amazing podcast. I have a CEO, Stephen Bartlett. Hey. Um, I don't do it because I don't like copying people's ideas, but I think it's really cool. I think for while we're in Melbourne, um. And it's all like econ brands. When, when we stop recording, I want to get you guys to leave a question that we'll ask the next. It doesn't have to be about econ, but we'll ask the next guest something you want to know about their journey, about a process. So it can be anything, but because we don't have that, because you're the first one, I just want to ask one because of you guys. Now we talked a lot about the ups and downs, the challenges, that sort of stuff, but just one last question. Let's end on a high. What's, what's the most exciting day of this whole journey for you guys? And it might be different days. It might be all the same, but like, what's been that one day you're like, it's all worth it every day, but like, what's been that one day that you just like, this has been the best. Um, definitely getting investment. Um, yeah. That was exciting. It sort of validated our idea. Um, which we, I think we were super pumped. I think we we're at Fidel's house um, that day and we just all got very excited with the offer that came through. Um, so yeah. High fiving. <laughs> yeah. I've, I've been there. It's cool. Mine was, um, it was actually the day after, um, I left my big four role. Um, it was the absolute weirdest feeling, uh, when I had a full day free <laughs> in front of me, um, just to focus on Hey Bud. Like that was com- before that it was about how do I squeeze two, three hours at midnight in, how do I squeeze all this time in around, around my full-time job, but having a full day in front of me just to completely dedicate myself to hey bud um it just was this surreal feeling at that point in time so um that's definitely a day i remember and there's been a million of them i could really really list off so many um but that's just one yeah that's got to be one for me is all the day i quit and then wake up oh shit like all day to mm. do this it's that's a dream come true in of itself for me anyway yeah and for me i would say one particular one was um, a very first uh, pitch to Priceline when we finished that because that was a brand new experience for us. 
we worked really hard putting this deck together. Everyone was presenting and whatnot um, and we smashed it and then we just had this massive camaraderie moment. Everyone was slapping hands and like, yeah, we made it. Um, that was a sick moment. Wow. So you actually had to fully pitch a brand? Fully pitch. Zoom or in person? Uh, Zoom. Yeah. Zoom. Yeah. yeah. Nerve wracking? No. So nerve wracking. <laughs> <laughs> we did like, you know, 10 run throughs, like, you know, every single week we were um, practicing, you know, changing the deck uh, all the time and it was so cool for it to pay off. Awesome. Yeah. I remember what I was going to say, um, talked about like something that's helped me a lot is just my three most important tasks for the day. And they're usually based around those high profit activities, but something that I've had to change because of the whole burnout factor. And maybe it's a little bit different for me because I, I'm the only owner. So it's like at the end of the day, all the really important stuff that has to get done, I have to do it. And, th- and there's certain things that there's no, it's not up for debate. It has to be done today with something for the U S or like a retailer, certain things, but what I've had to change and, I don't think you can do this at the start because you really need to do everything. But I used to all exclusively be like whatever I was on my list for today, I wouldn't stop working until I got it all done. And that could be, you know, 1am, 2am, whatever. But what I've had to do is apart from those three things, just go back to sometimes just working time, like to a certain extent. And if I haven't finished it, I'm going to go home and I'll finish it tomorrow morning. And that's all right. Mm. You, your business isn't going to go under because you didn't do everything every single day. And like, but a lot of people have a lot of anxiety about doing that, but it's going to, the process will be too, like more unenjoyable. You're very likely to lead to burnout. So doing that, I probably didn't start doing that to like two years in, but that helped me a lot. I don't know if you guys have ever had to you know, make decisions like that just to like have limits, you know, cause you want to have a life. The to do never ends. That's the thing. It never ends. Yeah. Right. There's always something more to do. So Absolutely everything you said. Cool boys. Well, um, we'll leave it there. Uh, what's the best place for everyone to get in contact with you guys, find out about Hey Bud, about your products? What's what's the best place? Heybudskincare.com. Yeah. Um, we've got a really cool Instagram. Um, but also one more thing I want to shout out. Um, so we were talking about mentors at the beginning uh, for your audience. Uh, Dylan was actually a mentor of ours two years ago. Back so we had, a, we had a yeah. call with you. Oh, we had two calls with you. Um, and you really helped us out a lot. Gave us a lot of really good guidance. So just wanted to express... Uh, Appreciation and gratitude for you too, man. Ah, uh, thanks, bro. I really appreciate that. Yeah, as uh, going to get back into that space. Been working a lot, so I haven't done any consulting for a year. Turned I've had to turn away a, a lot of people, but I built something really cool. So yeah, it's not launched yet, so it's a bit under under the wraps. But thanks for saying that, man. I've seen you guys grow so much, build amazing things. Took it from like a a business that you had a really cool hero product to a genuine skincare powerhouse in Australia. So congrats on your success, the price line deal, the investment. Excited to watch you guys continue to grow over the next few years. Thanks, man. Thanks, Thanks for you so much, man. Cheers, boys. All right, guys. Thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed this episode or you got something out of it, do yourself a favor, do me a favor, do your friends a favor and share this with them and they can come along on this journey with us. Thanks again and I'll see you next time.